So we've been discussing the process for becoming a registered architect and to review it's broken down into four main steps or four main categories. The first one education which we talked about and then internship, examination, and registration. And these steps, internship, the exam period, and registration are often kind of grouped together because they all are interrelated and often happen at the same time. Internship is a really key part of the training of an architect and preparing for licensure and registration. And when we talk about internship, I think sometimes it brings to mind, um, you know, people who are very young or working for not very much money or, uh, you know, doing kind of menial tasks. But the architectural internship really can span the period of time from the time that someone graduates from high school all the way up until the time that they're a uh, registered architect. So internship is really this catch-all category for anyone who is not yet licensed. So I think when we talk about internship it conjures some images to mind but I think you'll find that it's a pretty varied process or period of time and you have people all along the path toward licensure and because it can be such a lengthy process that the internship is kind of this large um, large range of both graduates and people and um, amounts of experience along the way. Now the experience requirement when we're talking about internship you know some people just refer to it as experience instead of saying internship because the idea of having education combined with experience is what we're talking about and the experience requirement has kind of gone through a uh, historical transformation so um, each individual state decides how much experience they're going to require before someone can become a registered architect and this has varied a lot in the last you know even 30 years but certainly in the last hundred years or 200 years um, you know we've talked earlier about how architectural education has evolved and changed and the idea of the experience required for an architect has also changed so um, as there has become more education required you know sometimes in certain places there was less experience required where maybe experience was the only um, exposure to architecture that an architect in training or um, someone yet to be licensed had uh, instead of formal education so when we talk about the experience requirement now it's really coupled with that NAB accredited uh, education or that NAB accredited degree and so we look at experience as supplemental to the education where maybe previously edu or experience might have been the only thing that was uh, required in the kind of an apprentice or journeyman type of format of becoming an architect. So now we look at experience in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, often we refer to it as internship, but I think the word experience really describes what you're trying to do or what you're trying to get someone to achieve. And that is, you know, not just having a theoretical knowledge or theoretical application of ideas, but taking those ideas and concepts learned in architecture school and being able to apply those to real world projects and real world technologies and strategies and certainly being able to learn from uh, being in 
a project-based environment where everything is realistic and all of the things that you perhaps had not considered before like budget and site and you know client development and business development and all the other things that go along with real architectural practice uh, there's a lot of knowledge gained there and uh, it's really kind of essential to combining that with the educational background so that you have a really well-rounded experience prior to becoming licensed. I think you know there's always a lot of debate within the architectural community about what experience should be required and what experience should be involved but I think most everyone agrees that there should be some level of experience since um, architecture is a real generalist type of education meaning you get a lot of exposure to a wide variety of course subjects and uh, topics but not necessarily expert level knowledge of any one topic and so if licensure happened right after education I think a lot of people feel like um, there wouldn't be a practical application for that and that there wouldn't be enough um, practical knowledge so uh, the experience component has um, definitely evolved and is constantly changing actually but is really a, a key essential component of the education of an architect now when we talk about you know how this is actually applied um, it's a nationalized system for being able to record and report and um, you know assess what experience people are getting because if you think about the logistics of you know all these people getting all kinds of experience you know how do you assess whether that's valid or how much they're getting um, so this is really a process that's evolved over time and really over the last um, I'd say 40 years it's really kind of been a process that's that's been refined um, when we talk about when the experience component was introduced um, that's hard to say but all the different states have in the United States have registration boards and all of them can make whatever experience requirement they want to. Now, over time, uh, a lot of people had gotten together in the later part of the 20th century and said, well, why don't we have a common standardized approach to how we require people to have experience after architecture school? So in the 70s, um, you know, many of the registration boards got together and started meeting about what that should be and so the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards is a series of all of the American you know, uh, registration boards in the United States and NCARB which we refer to it as is the National Council and that represents all of the um, registration boards in the US now there are actually 54 registration boards so um, there's all the 50 states then there's the District of Columbia Puerto Rico Guam and the US Virgin Islands so of those 54 registration boards the National Council represents all of them now the interesting thing is that each state or each jurisdiction you know you might be a US territory or a state is able to make their own rules and requirements as far as what they want to require for licensing an architect but because there are these more national standardized systems in place now most states have adopted the nationalized system so um, this graphic kind of says okay here are how many people are in the current system between uh, you know experience or internship and how many licensed architects there are so um, in this past year these are graphics from the past year so there are currently 30 a little over 37,000 uh, reporting 
aspiring architects. Now that just means they're people that are in the pipeline toward licensure. They're you know in the process of completing internship, and um, you know there's always this kind of push recently to see how we can get more people licensed because um, that time between graduation and licensure is often a really long period. And so this is saying, well, we're, we must be doing a better job because um, registration exam completions are up, internship completions are up, and uh, licensed architects are up uh, a little bit. Now, the main way that most people are able to show or demonstrate that they have experience is through the Intern Development Program. And we refer to this as IDP. Now, IDP 2.0 is the current version of the Intern Development Program that's used. And this is a nationalized system. So if a state chooses to have their own experience or internship requirements, they can do that. But if they want to adopt IDP 2.0, then they can say to all the people who want to reg get registered in their state, just follow the requirements for IDP, and we will accept that as your experience component. Now, some states, it's a bit easier for them to just say, OK, do the IDP. And in Texas, they've adopted IDP, so that's the standard for uh, demonstrating that you've completed the internship or the experience component of registration. Um, there are a few holdouts still. I think most states and territories have adopted IDP and um, it's frankly a lot easier for interns also or people who are trying to become licensed because you can use all of the standardized kind of nationalized reporting tools that come with IDP now and um, since all of those are online, it's a lot easier to kind of log in online and and use those tools. If your state doesn't adopt IDP and they still have experience requirement, they're probably going to have a series of their own forms that you need to fill out and that you need to send to your state periodically to report your experience. Now, when we look at the requirements for the intern development program, it's a series of hours. And when we talk about the hours, it means that an hour that you worked in reality equals one hour of experience. So when we talk about required hours, those are actual hours worked. Now, some people like to joke that, um, you know, architects should be getting through this a lot faster since you're working so many hours, you know, within a certain amount of weeks. But, um, you know, it all depends on what topic you're working on at work. And so when we look at these experience hours or these experience areas and their required hours, then we look at all of the different phases that need to be completed. So the main four components that we look at are pre-design, design, project management, and practice management. We'll take a look at those in a second. But each of those have a specific amount of hours. Now that doesn't mean that at your job, at your internship, you're only going to work on that many hours for that section and then you're going to stop. It means that you have to get at least that many and sometimes you're trying to ask your employer or your supervisor to put you on a project where you can get certain types of experience and the reason why all of these different areas are required is so that you get a broad range of experience th through your internship and then you're not just working on one thing for three years and then you say oh, okay well my now my experience is done um, but the total number of hours adds up to 3740 hours currently um, it has been more in the past uh, it's going to go through another um, kind of reiteration in 2016. They're going to release a separate set of guidelines um, supposedly in the middle of the year in 2016, which will have um, a bit fewer hours. And so you're trying to get those those specific amount of hours. Sometimes it's tough to get things like business operations hours or leadership and service hours or um, 
you know, maybe engineering systems hours. It just depends on what your office happens to work on and what you're trying to get as far as uh, experience goes. Pre-design is the first main category and when we talk about pre-design we're looking at you know all of the things that are involved with site development, site analysis, programming, anything that goes into looking at the project from the beginning and trying to assess all of the individual parameters that are going to influence the project. And pre-design is really critical because sometimes, you know, if you're an intern, you're just starting out and often you're put on a project that is midway through or maybe at the end or maybe they're working on construction documents. So it's almost like since all projects go in this process, you're trying to catch the wave of working on a new project. So a lot of times in an office you'll see architects or interns asking to be put on the beginning of a project so they can get some pre-design experience. Pre-design is also really instructive because you can see how different projects are varied in their approach to site analysis. Some might require a longer pre-design process. Uh, some might be more simplistic, but it's certainly a uh, a great um, kind of learning experience to be getting those pre-design hours. Um, the other thing that you are probably going to be doing as the intern in pre-design is physically going out to the site, walking the site with um, whoever else is on the project and whoever else is part of the project team and you know going through the process of discussing where the project is going to be sited and all of those kind of programmatic um, issues that relate to uh, what's going to impact the project the most. The other thing that you might be doing at this phase, especially as the intern, is doing code research, um, maybe doing some research at the city and looking at zoning and you know historic regulations and anything else that might potentially impact the building throughout the entirety of the project. And so that can be really instructive in terms of just figuring out how things work, how things work with governmental regulations and um, all the codes that will be applied to that particular project. When we look at design, this is often uh, a big part of what an office does, but it might not necessarily be a big part of what the intern will do. And so sometimes, you know, you've got to really uh, ask your supervisor to be part of the discussions in the design meetings and, you know, looking at all of the influences in the design phase of the project. And so, you know, often interns might be building models or doing renderings, and these are things that can actually be really effective when running an office is utilizing interns who were doing all of this when they were in school. You know, they have a lot more experience more recently, you know, building models and doing renderings and technological things than probably anybody else in the office. So um, being able to be a part of the design team and, you know, constructing all the things required for the design can be helpful both uh, from the intern's point of view and from the office's point of view. Project management is the third main component that's required for internship hours or for IDP hours. And project management can involve really anything from, you know, looking at interfacing with the contractor or other stakeholders such as um, the consultants. It could be doing coordination, um, but a lot of it involves construction administration and what is going to be required on the construction end of things and what the architect needs to do during construction. So construction administration is a 
a hugely beneficial part of the experience requirements because usually this is not something that you can get any other way unless you're actually working on a project. So even some of the design uh, hours and some of the design aspects of the building, that may have been closest to what um, interns were doing when they were in architecture school, but project management is kind of the main thing that you really can't get any other way except by walking the job site, taking notes, taking pictures, looking at how things are actually constructed in relation to how they were modeled or drawn, and then reporting back. So that's another kind of big component of of the hours. Probably the biggest component though is in the previous section in design is construction documents and so that's usually like the biggest number of hours but again that's a minimum amount of hours and you'll always go over that but you're trying to hit these different categories so that you at least have experience in all these areas. Practice management is one that just involves running the business and running the architecture business and sometimes these are difficult hours to get but often you know when supervisors are asked by interns to get some practice management hours they're probably more than happy to have you look at you know the business side of running an architecture office and this is something that is really difficult to get any other way simply than just by you know, looking at how things um, are budgeted, how you know people are paid, how um, you manage practice, and um, that can involve all kinds of things. It could be marketing, or you know, just running of the practice, or managing employees, and and things like that. But um, this is something that was introduced. Um, as kind of a bigger component in more recent years with the IDP and I think is really beneficial especially to people who are kind of coming up in the business being able to see what is required of running the business and um, being having those hours required actually is a good source of leverage for um, younger employees or interns to be able to kind of step up and say you know I need this for IDP um, can I you know sit in on these meetings or can I look at this and IDP is actually a way to help you um, kind of get that experience where I think if IDP were not required it wouldn't be as um, as much of a tool for you to say to your boss like hey can I you know be more involved in the management of the practice so I think that's uh, pretty beneficial. Um, the experience settings that IDP addresses, it means that you don't have to just be in an architecture office. Now there are three different categories for the acceptable experience settings for IDP. Um, now the main one is that you're getting paid for your internship. You know sometimes when we hear the word internship we think of some like you know thing where uh, it's like free labor that the business is getting and there's a student who's basically kind of working away for free but that is not what IDP is is meant to be and the way that they have actually enforced that is by saying unless you get paid for this you will not receive IDP, IDP credit for those hours that you work so if you want to get IDP credit hours then you need to be getting paid for your um, employment. And it is employment. I mean, you're working a job. This is not like a temporary thing either. Um, this is a, an architecture job that you got or another type of job that you got and, and you're just working your job. Um, so the practice of architecture is the main one. And so that's a minimum of 1,860 hours. And it, so all of your hours can be in the practice of architecture. Um, one of the other work settings you could have or kind of the other segment is other work settings and that could be working for a contractor, working for someone who's um, you know in a related field to architecture like interior design, landscape architecture, uh, those sorts of things. Now there's a maximum of 1860 hours that you can get in that setting. And then uh, supplemental experience 
Uh, you know, sometimes with supplemental experience, you can do community service like Habitat for Humanity or something like that. And, you know, you may not necessarily be getting paid for that. Um, but there are some listings for supplemental experience. And there's kind of a long list on the NCARB and IDP websites where they list out what those are. But some of them, if they're supposed to be a work environment, they need to be getting paid for those as well. Um, so you don't have to be working under a registered architect the entire time, but you do have to be a minimum of 1,860 hours. Uh, so, you know, there are different categories for um, the other work settings and supplemental experience that are listed out under the terms of IDP. As far as eligibility goes, there are really very few requirements for becoming eligible to earn hours through IDP. And really now the only eligibility requirement is that you graduate from high school, that you have contacted um, NCARB to start your IDP and council record, and that you have a way of um, recording your hours so you have to you know show like uh, your high school diploma and birth certificate and things like that and then you need to identify a supervisor who is going to be verifying that you actually work those hours and then you also need to verify that you have contacted a mentor and a mentor doesn't have to be someone you're working for but typically is a licensed architect who's going to help you kind of long term uh, in guiding your career. Uh, some of the reporting requirements, you just have to log on periodically to the IDP website and you need to put your experience report in, you need to show that your supervisor has signed off on the hours that you worked, and then you need to identify what category those hours fit under. Fit under. So um, you can kind of see your running total of how many hours you've worked, how many have been approved, and how many you have left, um, which is actually really helpful because the old version, the old pre-internet version of this was you just filled it out on this paper form and mailed it in and then you hope that somebody got it and you were kind of trying to keep those track track of those yourself. Um, another issue is the issue of intern titling, like what do you call interns? And some states call them intern architects, some call them architectural interns, but because you could be in this period between high school graduation and licensure for a really long time, you know, that could be a period of, let's say, 15 years, and maybe, you know, as a 30-year-old who's been working for 10 years, you might not want to be called an intern anymore. And so different states have been debating about what to call um, their interns. And so these are kind of all the titles. It could be architect in training, architectural intern, intern architect, um, but it really varies from state to state. Uh, emerging professionals is a kind of an arm of the AIA, the American Institute of Architects and it addresses issues that are important to um, not only interns but really anyone who is in the path of licensure so anyone between uh, you know in architecture school just finishing architecture school or working toward uh, taking the exams and working toward finishing the internship um, and so it addresses uh, people who are earlier in their career instead of just addressing you know things that might be important to somebody who is has owned a firm for several years so the emerging professionals wing of the AIA is really active in issues of internship and gaining experience supervisors and mentors um, are really important you know I mentioned a minute ago that supervisors are the ones that are going to be directly overseeing your employment and they'll verify that you worked your hours. Um, it's helpful if they're a registered architect. They don't necessarily need to be um, depending on your experience setting, you know, what type of place you work in. Uh, but a mentor is someone hopefully you can identify who will 
help your career long term. And usually that's someone who doesn't work in your office. It's someone who could work in your office, but it can be somebody outside of your office, hopefully is a registered architect who's been working for a while, but they can give you advice periodically about your career path and what to do next.